Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about some research that I've been doing with Sam and Matthias recently. Um, I'm particularly interested in the kinds of things that our programming languages can't do at the moment. Uh, so one of the things that they're not that great at doing is uh, talking about virtual machines and the environments in which our programs run. They're also not that great at talking about networks. So one of the things that Dan Engels, who was one of the original implementers of Smalltalk, said is that an operating system is a collection of things that don't fit into a language, and so there shouldn't be one. So we've been working on trying to take these ideas of virtual machines, networks, and sort of pull them into our programming languages. And we've been using Racket's uh, language development, DSL development features to do that. So first of all, I just want to give you an idea of what uh, virtual machines mean in, in, in our setting to our, to our minds. So if you think about a browser application, just some application that some web developer has written, it's running in a page in your browser. It's written in JavaScript. It's running on a JavaScript virtual machine. And it's one of these per open tab in your, uh, in your browser. And that browser is itself a process that's running on the Linux kernel, which in some cases is running on virtualized hardware that's running inside a process which is running on another kernel, which is running on the real hardware, we hope. And this is not at all uncommon. This is the kind of thing that you might do, for instance, if you're testing a web application. You, know, you might need to test it on Linux. You might need to test it on Windows. You might be running on a different operating system. So this kind of stack actually does crop up in the wild. And if you think about deploying the server side of a web application as well, you've got a similar structure there. You've got the application sitting inside a virtual machine, which is on a process, which is in a virtual machine, which is on a hypervisor, which is on somewhere in the cloud. Um, there's a second kind of layering that you see very frequently that, again, our programming languages don't really have a lot of traction on. And that's uh, networking. Uh, so network stacks end up being a lot deeper than the OSI model would have you believe. Uh, the picture that is going to end up uh, on this slide is uh, taken from a paper by Pamela Zave and Jennifer Rexford. Uh, and it is a, a real packet. It's the structure of a real packet uh, and quite a typical packet. Uh, from the AT&T backbone. And uh, here we see uh, the application protocol, it's the innermost layer, and that is being tunneled across HTTP in this case, which as we know runs on TCP, which runs on IP, which in this case was running on IPsec, which was tunneled over IP, which was tunneled over the g general tunneling protocol, which uses UDP, which needs IP, <laughs> which was being carried over MPLS in this instance, tunneled through MPLS, <laughs> wrapped in an Ethernet packet. This is a real packet. This is typical. It's 12 layers deep. This is pretty far away from the OSI model. So this is the kind of mess that we get ourselves into with layering and, uh, and containers and, and uh, modular systems. But these layers do a lot for us. They give us a kind of modularity that you can't otherwise get. So each layer is a modular system that you can think about on its own. Um, each layer has a characteristic protocol that it speaks. So, you know, when you're thinking about the kind of vocabulary that you use for HTTP, it's quite different from the kind of vocabulary you use for TCP or for IP, let alone whatever your application is. Each layer has a, a distinct naming system. So if you think back to the example of the browser, when you're thinking about the Unix kernel and the things that it manages, it manages processes. They're named by process ID. But if you look at the TCP stack here, the TCP layer there, that names different things. That names connection endpoints, and it names them by IP and port combination. And they aggregate flows going down the stack, and they de-aggregate and demultiplex flows going up the stack. So you can share resources at the IP layer and have multiple applications sharing that common resource. So layering's great, but our languages don't do a lot for us. So our project with Marketplace has been to kind of try and grow PL and invade this other territory of the, the complete computing system, or seen the other way, pull in ideas from networking and operating systems into the programming language. And I mean, this is, this is an idea with a long history. Going, you know, Dan Engels was saying it. I mean, a lot of the people in this room have already thought about how to make Racket into more of an operating system-like thing. Um, we're taking a, a, a different approach. So Marketplace itself is an actor-based system, but our actors are pure functions. There's a lot of similarity with Big Bang for those of you who've used that. The idea is that you've got a function, which is stateless, and a piece of state. And whenever anything changes in the world that that function is interested in, the event describing the change, along with the current state of the actor is given to the actor, which does some thinking for a while, and then spits out a bunch of actions that it wishes uh, were, were to be put into effect, and, and a new state for itself. So, um, so actors respond to events by updating their state and computing a series of actions. 
In Marketplace, actors are grouped into virtual machines and given a shared bus which they are able to use to communicate with each other. And here's the first place that we depart from a regular actor-based system like, say, Erlang. Uh, in ordinary actor-based systems, you have uh, a mailbox for each actor, and when you are sending a message through the system, you address it to a specific mailbox and it goes to that specific actor. Whereas here, we're using publish subscribe messaging. This is a kind of a generalization of a lot of different addressing protocols, and it can scale from multicast through broadcast. You can do point to point. Uh, you can even do any cast if you have a slightly different routing algorithm. But here we're using PubSub so that actors can share interests in topics that they have in common. And in particular, we're exploiting that to uh, introduce this idea of presence, service presence. Those of you who've used XMPP, this chat algorithm, when you have this little roster on your screen, it shows who's online. You can think of that as who is interested in talking to you right now, because if they were offline, then clearly there's no point in sending anything to them because they're not listening. So you can use this idea of presence to get an idea of who else is out there and who else is willing to have a conversation about a particular topic with you. So when we have, say, actor A here, might say, I am interested in hearing about the price of gold. We might have actor C saying, I'm interested in telling people about the price of gold. Then what the virtual machine is going to do with that information, it's going to notice, aha, these subscriptions match. So I'll tell these actors about each other. So they get told about the presence of the other actor. And when one or other of the actors decides, no, I'm not interested anymore, I'll withdraw my subscription. Or maybe, heaven forfend, the actor crashes, right, and it, and it gets killed by the system. The system will automatically retract all of its subscriptions. And when it does so, it removes the presence notification as well. It tells the peers that were in conversation with the failed actor that there's no longer anyone listening. And so the conversation is effectively over, and they can clean up their state, they can deallocate their resources, and so on. The second difference between us and a regular actor system is that we exploit this pure functional type. So with this type here, we, we see that actors strictly are given an event and respond with some actions. And so that gives you a really nice tight connection between an actor and its containing virtual machine. And that lets us make the virtual machine into an actor itself. So the virtual machine itself has the same type as an actor. The virtual machine takes events from the outside world or from the hardware, if you like, and then thinks about them for a bit by sending them on to its children, collects up the actions that its child actors wish to take, and sends them back out to the environment again. And this lets you stack them recursively. And this is starting to give us here a picture of the deep recursive layering that we saw in the network packet. And the recursive layering that we saw with the virtual machine example uh, interrupts from the hardware get translated into res re uh, results from select get translated into calls to subroutines and so forth. Oh, I should point out that one other thing that we do that's a little bit different. Because we have this layered structure, actors now have to be aware of the layering. And uh, that leads them to be able to communicate. A can talk to C by talking across this bus. But another actor out here, A can talk to that by saying to its kernel, hey, could you pass this on for me down to the outer layer? Sure. And so then it ends up on the outer bus. And you can push that down as far as you need to go. So you can be aware of outer layers of the stack. So in summary, uh, actors take actions. They send messages. They spawn other actu actors. They can quit themselves, exit the process. They add and delete subscriptions. They can observe subscriptions that are nearby. Uh, and they can respond to presence and absence notifications from the environment. And they can respond to messages coming in from other peers nearby. So enough of that. And let's have a look at a real program. It's going to be a really simple program because uh, a larger one would take too long to explain. It's going to be an echo server. So it's the kind of thing that's a, it's listening on a TCP port. You connect it with Telnet, and whatever you send gets sent straight back to you. So if you install Marketplace, you get a new hash lane. And as soon as you start a file with that hash lane, it starts up a, a, a virtual machine that's connected at the bottom to the outside world via Racket's event system. Racket's amazing CML event system. It's really awesome. And it also starts up services like a timer driver and a TCP driver. And these are things that make ordinary system services appear to be sub services that you can interact using messaging. So in this case, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to say, we have an interest in other actors that want to talk to us. So we're going to observe them. The first action that our primordial actor takes 
is that it, it starts looking at, looking for the presence of, of people, of, of other actors that appear in the system that want to talk about TCP, that want to talk to local port number 5999. So this is how we set up a listen socket. And all we've done here is declare an interest in hearing about other people, other actors in the system. The TCP driver notices our interest, and in response, it creates a process that manages the actual BSD socket, the actual listening socket. When a connection arrives from the outside world, that TCP listener process spawns a process in response for managing the connection. Now this is really similar to Erlang, it's just that we're doing it with PubSub rather than doing it with mailboxes. And this TCP connection process says, I am willing to talk about bytes traveling across this particular TCP connection, if anyone's out there that's interested in that. So the acceptor, this highlighted in yellow that we just wrote here by observing the presence of publishers, has just observed the presence of a publisher. And so it gets an on-presence event. The on-presence event carries a description of the conversation that's just started up, which we promptly take to pieces, and used to spawn a process to handle the new connection. Moving on to that process, the first thing it does is tell the virtual machine what state it wants to manage. And here we don't have any particular state that we're going to manage. It's a sort of a stateless echo service, so we supply some dummy value. Um, more sophisticated systems will need to use uh, a state, uh, uh, stateful actors, um, but we won't see any of those here. There are some examples later you guys can look at. I've got some URLs. The first actual actions that the system will take, so it's, it's supplied its state to the kernel. This is what I'm going to be passing around. This is what the kernel is going to be giving to me every time I get an event, along with the event. And the actions it takes are to say, I am willing to talk about, I'm willing to send bytes on this topic, and I would wish, I wish to receive bytes on this topic. When they arrive, I take them out of their envelope, put them in an envelope with a return address on it, and send them straight back out again. So we receive a message. We take it to pieces, extracting the data. Notice how this is the same pattern as the topic that we said that we were interested in hearing about. And we send a message which just has the to and from address switched. The final piece of the puzzle is what do we do when somebody closes the connection? Well, if they close the connection, that'll cause the socket to shut down. And then this system provided TCP connection service will simply exit. That's all it does, it just exits. But because of the presence mechanism, the kernel notices that one of the conversational participants is now gone. So it informs the other one, hey, your peer has gone away now. We get an on absence notification. We get told that our conversational partner is gone. And in response, this process exits in turn. So that's a really simple example. We haven't seen very much of the system in use. There are other examples out there. So this is a picture of the kind of process structure that you see for a simple chat server. It's very much like IRC. It's about 35 lines of code. Um, the example is contained in the examples directory of the marketplace source code. Um, but we didn't just build toy examples, we've also built some real services. Uh, one of them is a DNS resolver process that has been serving DNS requests in our lab for more than a year now. Uh, and the source code to that is available uh, and demonstrates quite a few of the features of marketplace. Another is an implementation of the SSH protocol. Now this is a layered protocol that is actually quite a good fit for marketplace. And uh, again, that's, that's available on GitHub. Finally, I just want to say that from a couple of simple ideas, PubSub and virtual machines, we've gotten a lot of really interesting features um, that are implemented over and over and over again when you look at uh, layered network protocols. Um, we've managed to pull them so that they're available from within a racket domain-specific language. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, my understanding though is that you don't implement the virtual machine. Me as a user, I implement my process, but I don't implement my virtual machine. There's a virtual machine that you do. Yep. Um, is it imaginable to write the virtual machine yourself so that you can decide when processes get run? So essentially, you can write your scheduling algorithm. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Or is there a way in which you handle messaging? 
That's right, yep, yep. So um, at the moment, it's not structured so that that code is modular enough that you could plug in a new scheduler, but it could easily be done that way. And in a pinch, because it has the same interface as any other actor, you can just write an actor that does what you want, uh, and nobody will be able to detect it. The actors won't know that they're hosted by a strange virtual machine, and the hosting virtual machine of your virtual machine won't know either. So. 